1201 on our clock. Terry, what happened to you? Oh, no, did we lose our MP? Isn't he going first? <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so, everybody, <laughs> as Terry was saying, welcome to the uh, Northeast Extension Fruit Consortium's uh, webinar series. This is our, our noontime educational session. Um, today we're going to be discussing Northeast Cider Apple Project updates. Um, and as soon as, as Terry comes back on, I believe he'll be kicking us off. And it looks like Terry's back with us. Great. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I've had some computer issues here. If I bump a cord wrong things, it's so we're not going to touch anything today. Um, so yeah, welcome. Thank you for, for covering for that, uh, Liz and, and uh, everyone on the team here, but without further ado, um, let's talk a bit about what we're what we're covering today. Um, so this is the second uh, uh, webinar of the New England Cider Apple Project. Uh, we had one this time last year, uh, and it actually had a, an introductory meeting back at the last live New England Veg and Fruit meeting uh, a few years ago. So. Um, just wanted to mention that I, we're kind of putting a pin in things and Renee actually gave me that, that I don't know if she used that exact terminology, but, you know, research uh, is, is never ending. So I just wanted to kind of make a point about we're sticking a, a pin on the map in terms of where things are at and uh, we'll keep developing, uh, you know, this field of research and this outreach as we move along. I want to start off and I realize this is just the, uh, the, the Vermont side for the, for the most point. Um, but providing acknowledges, acknowledgement, particularly to Northeast SARE, uh, who are funding this work. Uh, they do great work and, and they've been uh, funding this as well as some of the orchards that we work with, at least in Vermont and the Massachusetts and Maine folks may have some, some other folks to, to give nods to, uh, but just wanted to start out with that. So every time uh, you have a discussion about cider and cider apples, uh, it's always important to recognize that there's several different parts of this industry. And uh, those who've paid attention to the, the marketing of the sales of cider over time, uh, if you look back at 2013-14, we saw this insane trajectory. And, and I often say that you know, any, any uh, finance person would say, um, how do I get on this train, number one? And number two is, when's the bubble going to burst? Um, and Things have, have certainly quieted down a little bit in terms of, of the really rocket growth of cider as a product, but it has not changed by any means in terms of it being important to um, the apple industry. And a, a really important thing, and this is something that started back in seven, eight years ago, um, when we were seeing such a growth in, in, in the cider industry, was the uh, change in the floor price of apples. So when we used to sell apples, and, and, and when I'm saying apples, I mean, at that point, dessert fruit uh, that, uh, you know, seconds or, or some other cold fruit that are sold to a secondary market, you know, 20 years ago, you were selling those for a substantial loss, um, often not even enough to bother picking them up off the ground. And the, and the floor, the bottom price of that, that cider fruit is raised two to three times as much. Um, and so that's not something to uh, ignore, um, but it's also not something to really plan for. This is still in terms of, of the production of dessert apples for sales to cideries really is still a byproduct of, of a uh, strong wholesale and retail orchard market. Um, so I just wanna highlight that there's still a lot of interest and this is mostly what we're gonna be talking about is interest in higher value apples, fruit that have inherently higher value um, than the castoffs, and there is a market. Um, I'm not going to talk any more after this about the market for cider because it's really about cider apples. And uh, as far as as growers are concerned, um, it's the apple that matters. In a lot of cases, the grower might be the cider maker, uh, but you still want to try to hone in and narrow your costs as much as possible. Um, you know, just to to be competitive. Keep an eye on the time here. So I just hopped on the Fruit Grower News website and typed in cider on the on the search bar and uh, you know picked a handful of some of the latest articles. I think the point that I wanted to make here is that cider, and when I say cider, I mean cider as a category, um, fermented cider as a category, uh, went from about 2013, 14 or so to now to a a seriously taken component of the of the fruit production system. 
Um, whereas before, I think it was kind of an anomaly. Um, as a sector, it wasn't that big, but um, there's been a tremendous amount of, of effort and work and interest in going toward shifting our production systems and shifting our mindset around how to uh, try to, as I used to say, put an apple in every bottle. Um, the, and as we look at this, we're looking at different types of apples besides just the coals. But this is, this is something I don't see uh, going back. When you think about Fruit Grower News, and I think about when I started in this business, we wanted to do everything we could to not grow a cider apple because a cider apple was worth you know, four cents a pound. Um, and now we've got whole fields of, of research and uh, whole sectors of the industry that are moving toward this higher value uh, uh, sector. So that's really what we're talking about, supporting and interested in supporting. And we're going to talk a bit about uh, a lot of our experiences across uh, New England the last couple of years uh, in what we've seen in terms of supporting this. The other thing that's been tricky in the last couple, well, as we roll out into this uh, uh, body of research and outreach, is there's such a diversity of scale amongst producers, and I recognize the names on the on the list here. Uh, we have everyone from you know 200 acre orchards that are planting 10 or 15 or 20 acres of cider apples to people who are shaking apples onto onto uh, tarps and collecting them on a on a small scale, and um, there's, there's, it's tricky to kind of try to apply some of the things we've learned across the board on here, but there's still the, the production of apples is largely the same. I mean, a little bit different when you're shaking apples from, from feral trees onto, onto, uh, onto tarps. We're looking more at how to manage orchards. Uh, but it is important to recognize that the cost, the economics, and some of the, the labor issues are really different depending upon the scale we're looking at. Uh, just moving apples by bins as opposed to dragging things around in, in tarps is just one example of how uh, you know, economies of scale will change the costs and labor involved. So I just like to highlight that there's gonna be, people are coming to this with a lot of different, uh, from a lot of different uh, uh, spots. So we started this a couple of years ago, uh, right before the, the pandemic started um, with a few objectives. So the first one, and, and this is an area where I think a lot of the, uh, well, certainly a lot of the effort has gone in, is to try to dig into this uh, uh, issue that we've had with biennialism on specific cider apple cultivars. A number of the, of the cultivars that are of interest to growers um, have a pronounced biennial growth bearing habit. And so we've got a few different projects um, that we've been looking at. And actually some of these are even different because we've changed um, the protocols as time goes over, but to try to manage that, because that's going to matter, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, on a pretty big basis in terms of the economics. Uh, another area that we're looking at is just evaluating and documenting and observing the unique pests, and when I say pests, that includes disease pests, and I would say largely includes disease pests, um, incidence and susceptibility on these cider apple cultivars. So making some uh, observations and uh, trying to figure out if there's a way to manage these to, to either improve on the inherent problems or to try to save costs, um, you know, where we're trying to, to produce what's essentially a, a um, you know, a processing grade fruit, but, uh, per, you know, so, and, and therefore lower our cost to provide it to that market. And then just make some observations of the cultivars as they're grown in the region. Um, I'll keep going from that. We showed that last year. So a colleague of mine and, and, and their research team uh, recently published a paper. Um, this is the uh, Apples to Glass project out of Washington State. Um, a large survey done across most of the northern or, or representatives of the northern tier of the US, Vermont, Washington, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, talking to growers. And um, it was interesting. So this was from 20, uh, 2020. So 2019, 2020, last couple of years, um, saw some interesting uh, uh, results that came out of, of these data. So a number of producers um, agreed, 75 or so percent, 70-75 percent, um, were planning to expand their cider apple operation. But it was interesting that the split in terms of uh, consumer demand for cider was about half and half in terms of agreeing and disagreeing. So I think we're, we are seeing that kind of softening of the market or at least softening of um, uh, people's perceptions and I would say willingness to take risks to uh, get into this market. 
Um, but still strong demand for craft ciders. We're seeing uh, increase in the sales of uh, small produced kind of orchard produced ciders as compared to um, ciders that are produced from you know mass market domestic uh, or dessert fruits um, that that that's kind of had that softening. So there is is an interest in there, but I would say it's a a cautious interest. So talking to a number of growers, this is uh, uh, data from the same paper that came out recently. Um, there was a few things that were of interest, and I would say there's two, and I'm going to revisit this chart in a in a couple of ways. A lot of these. Um, really aren't unique, I think, to cider apple production necessarily. You know, orchard floor management might be a little bit different and if you're shaking apples on the ground and picking them up, things like that. Um, but really one of the biggest ones that came out, you know, we've got 80% of, of producers saying that biennialism was a very challenging to, to somewhat challenging issue. And this is something that continues to stand out uh, in, in terms of cider apple production. So um, this is a this is matters a lot. So it's not just uh, that you have fruit or you don't have fruit or you know you've got uh, you know kind of supply chain management. If we look at a, I've got a model that I use and I can kind of work out lots of different scenarios for for producing uh, orchards and, and change different categories. If we take a vertical axe, kind of a moderate density orchard, costs about twelve thousand dollars to plant. Um, we get $20 a bushel, which is a um, optimistic, but I think sometimes realistic price um, for our fruits. Get about 800 bushels per acre. So again, being fairly conservative, we can see that after 20 years, we're, we have a net present value of about $60,000 per acre that we've accumulated over time. Um, you've probably seen curves like this a lot. If we add a factor in here to just make that orchard biennial, so we go from, 100% um, crop to, I, in this model, I use a 20% crop, so you even still have a few fruit. Um, you can see that we don't cross the line from, uh, in terms of net uh, profitability for, for a given year from six to now almost 10 years. So you're four years out in terms of starting to see your return on investment. And you're about $40,000 down after 20 years. So this really is an important uh, issue uh, in terms of the long-term economic viability of, of uh, cider orchards, any orchard. So looking at some of the data that, that uh, we did from some of the work in Vermont, um, wanted to highlight a few things. So uh, first of all, we had a hedging trial. So we wanted to look at, and this, is, this has been some work, a lot of this kind of stems from work that's been done on Honeycrisp, another very high value uh, biennial, uh, uh, relatively biennial variety. So we looked at a few things. Uh, if you hedge, the idea with this is if you pinch off the, the terminal buds uh, and force the production of side, side buds, you, you could potentially produce more fruiting buds in a, uh, in a narrower canopy, kind of closer to the trunk. We did this on some dessert varieties that are known to be um, uh, annual producing. So, uh, and these data show, the, the, the thing I wanna point out about these data is uh, forget about the treatments that you see um, in here. The fact is there's very little difference among the, from year to year because these are annual varieties, right? You see a little depression in this year because we cut a bunch of the canopy out. But for the most part, we're, we've got, you know, relatively decent production year after year. And I'm just looking at the number of flowers is a nice way to, to get a sense for potential production. When we looked at cider varieties, um, you can see tremendous um, uh, drop in certain years. You also don't see um, a lot of difference in these treatments. We didn't really see any in these p-values if it's more than 0.05 um, and really if it's more than 0.2 or so, there's no statistical difference between the treatments. So I wouldn't really pay too much attention in terms of the relative values year to year, but looking within the treatments that we have, which was uh, dormant pruned at different times and then hedged at different times, um, we were not able to change the biennial pattern of these particular varieties, number one, because uh, we had no statistical differences. Number two, Harry Masters Jersey showed extreme biennialism. Uh, and in 2019, we actually weren't able to harvest these fruit before they were, they were harvested elsewhere. Um, so we don't have that data. 
in 2020, when we went down to harvest the fruit and there wasn't a single apple to be found. They were that biennial. Um, and so that was, that's, that's a key take home is so many of these varieties are, some varieties are a little bit less pronounced, um, but we weren't able to break that pattern with hedging for a couple of years. Another trial that we, that we conducted under this particular project, and this is kind of follows up on another trial we did a few years ago, was looking at some of the thinners or plant growth regulators, or really thinners, um, to try to uh, force trees, as we do with, with annual or, or with dessert fruit, into a more annual uh, habit by uh, thinning more heavily. And we can see when we look in here, Harry Master Jersey, again, extremely biennial. All these cases, no statistical difference, even though there were some practical differences, but no statistical differences in terms of how we were able to uh, break that biennial habit um, off of these. And so we saw Kingston Black, strong biennial habit, um, also decreasing uh, productivity. Um, but in this case, we, we were not able to uh, shift the, um, uh, the, the production to an annual production habit based upon the use of plant growth regulators. Um, this, was, this data should be carried out further and I think on so many other varieties and that's one of the tricks of doing this uh, type of work is there's so many different European cider varieties that tend to respond differently. Uh, and, and that's something that's, that's uh, a little tricky to do when you've got uh, so many to work with. I'm gonna ask Renee to step in for a moment and then I'll see you back in 25 minutes or so. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm Renee Moran, and I work in Maine. And um, the focus of my talk is going to be on um, some spur pruning research I did on Honeycrisp. I was also supposed to do some strengthening research, but I decided to cancel that because um, there was too much fire blight in the cider orchards where I wanted to work. So. Um, Let's get back to Honeycrisp. It's one of the most biennial varieties that we grow here in the Northeast in New England. We have uh, several orchards at Highmore Farm where I've been doing about three or four spur pruning studies, but I'm gonna focus on the one where I've been doing it for three years in a row. And um, when I first started doing this uh, project, there was a question of whether or not it would work. And um, so I wanted to, follow it through uh, several years to see how well it uh, moderated crop load in Honeycrisp. At Highmore Farm, we have the uh, fruit tree team, uh, Greg Kohler, Pete Lugner, who's retired, uh, Peyton Janakis and myself, and um, the source of funding was the SARE grant. So in 2018, the year before I started spur pruning, I started to notice that trees had become biennial. And this was done in a rootstock trial where I have 12 different rootstocks. This graph shows you the year to year variation in yield with these three rootstocks, Geneva 41, Geneva 214, and Geneva 969. Um, the very high yield in the 969 started set these trees off on a biennial bearing pattern a year ahead of the other two rootstocks. 214 had a phenomenal yield in 2019. And when I went out into the orchard in the wintertime, I saw that there were too many flower buds on these trees. So I started spur pruning them. I spur pruned a set of uh, each rootstocks and not spur pruned another set. And uh, for some reason, the Geneva 41s did not become biennial until 2020 when they were in their seventh leaf or the seventh year in the orchard. So there was a large variation from year to year in um, crop load and yield, and these rootstocks are behaving differently. So within one orchard, I'll have some trees in the on year and some trees in the off year. And uh, in 2021, there was a reduction in yield not related to biennial bearing. Um, you probably heard some researchers talk about crop density, and this is simply a way of expressing the number of fruit per trunk size. And it really only matters in trees that are um, less than seven years old, because once the trees 
reach a certain size, crop density just goes down because um, the ratio of fruit to trunk size changes. But in the early years, it's recommended that you keep crop density below uh, six fruit per square centimeter of trunk cross-sectional area. And um, so this shows you the high degree of variation in these three rootstocks from year to year with uh, 969 starting out with a crop load that was too heavy and consequently the following year these trees had fewer flower buds. Geneva 214 became biennial after 2019, a substantial decrease in 2020, followed by yet another decrease. And this decrease in 2021 is simply because the trees are getting, the trunks are getting big in relation to the crop load, but also that mysterious reduction in yield. Geneva 41 was somewhat annual in its production until a heavy crop load year 2020, followed by that decrease indicating that they're biennial now. But um, I find crop density to be somewhat confusing. Uh, I like to just focus on crop load. But to get trees to become more annual, some of us have been studying uh, different techniques. Um, I guess most growers rely on initially just to prune the trees every year in a standard technique. This also helps to reduce or moderate the crop load. But with, um, in some years, Honeycrisp will produce an overabundance of flowers and just general pruning isn't enough to reduce it. Um, effective chemical thinning doesn't always happen with this variety. So um, for years, we tried summer sprays of Ethafon and NAA, and now we uh, understand that these may be too late to prevent uh, biennial bearing. So um, let's get back to spur pruning. This is the third year of this project. In the first year, 2019, trees were in their sixth leaf and it was an on year for most of the rootstocks. So uh, I did severe by any, I did severe pr spur pruning, taking off um, at least 50% of the flower buds on most of the trees. And this was combined with the standard pruning for a tall spindle orchard, which involves uh, limb renewal. <clears throat> where you prune back the limb uh, almost to the trunk. Um, do that about one or two uh, limbs per tree. In the following year, the spur pruning was not as severe and I started doing uh, what some people call simplification or columnarizing. And this is just simply removing some of the longer side branches. As these limbs get older, they become uh, more dense. So pruning them back so that they're just uh, short shoots and spurs. So uh, finally getting into some of the results, results from this study. In the top graph, uh, this shows you the crop load in all 12 rootstocks from 2018 through 2021, 2019 being the year when I started spur pruning. And uh, the spur pruned um, crop load would be these red circles. And yes, there was a reduction with the spur pruning in this year. And then the following year, there was a slight increase in the number of flowers per tree, number of fruit per tree, and then um, a significant increase in uh, crop load in this last year. So yes, it was working to moderate the crop somewhat. And um, the yield was um, slightly different because uh, spur pruning increased fruit size. So the reduction in yield in the first year wasn't substantial. And then the following year with the increase, the biennial bearing in the regularly pruned trees resulted in a reduction <clears throat> in yield, but um, not statistically. There was a problem with some of the rootstocks being in the on year and others being in the off year, which made the statistics kind of funky. So from a practical standpoint, I, I felt that um, the spur pruning is doing its job in moderating crop load and preventing that reduction in the yield. <coughs> Excuse me. So looking at two individual rootstocks, Geneva 41, which was fairly annual in its bearing up until 2020, and Geneva 214, which became biennial fairly early on. 
One thing I learned was that in pruning annual bearing trees, severe spur pruning does reduce yield and doesn't really benefit the trees until they become biennial. In the biennial bearing Geneva 2014, spur pruning did have an impact in some benefit um, in the years following the first year of spur pruning where there was an increase in crop load. So it does matter whether or not the trees are biennial or annual. So if they're annual, then spur pruning doesn't seem to help much, but if there's a biennial, and in the case of 214, they were severely so, it did make it, it did help to increase crop load. So that would be my recommendation for when an orchard should be spur pruned, paying attention to whether or not it's become biennial or not. If you notice that your trees have an overabundance of um, flower buds or fruit buds, then that would be a good year to get started. So the second half of this talk is going to be about um, the precision crop load management technique, where um, in a previous talk with Terrence Robinson, he um, presented his method where you count the number of flower buds and do a lot of dissection <coughs> of buds to make to find out how many are floral versus leafy, which can be somewhat cumbersome. And um, I tried that this year. Um, two different methods were uh, the quick and easy method, simply walking through the orchard and looking at uh, seeing the relative number of trees that had an abundance of flower buds uh, versus the number of trees that did not. And it can be very uneven in a honey crisp um, orchard where you have some trees with no flower buds right next to trees with excessive flower buds. That would be the first uh, thing I would recommend for uh, growers of honey crisp is to just to walk through the orchards uh, while you're pruning them or at this time of the year <clears throat> and see if there's an overabundance or insufficient number of buds. If you don't find enough, don't bother spur pruning. The second method was extremely time consuming and um, this involved cutting out limbs, uh, about five, three to five limbs that are representative of the trees in the orchard, taking them into the lab and dissecting each of the, what I thought were flower buds on these limbs. <coughs> this was a great exercise in learning to distinguish leaf and flower buds. So I would recommend trying it out yourself if you're uncertain uh, whether or not a bud is floral or just leafy. So uh, cutting out five representative limbs, they should have um, um, good, good spur development if that's what's occurring in your orchard. And um, after that, I take them to the lab and test my ability to distinguish them. This just uh, involved cutting off each of these spurs and flower buds and grouping them according to whether or not I thought they were uh, fruit buds or just leaf buds and the ones I was uncertain about. So this was my best guess. And then after that, I dissected each of these buds. Um, you don't need a microscope. Microscopes are kind of expensive. Um, I use a dissecting scope. Um, which is in the background here, and they range in price from uh, used at $200 upwards of $3,000, which is too fancy for this. Um, dissecting scopes are useful for distinguishing um, buds that are not floral or fruit buds, where they're just leafy, because those are hard to see. If they do have a flower cluster inside them, it's pretty easy to tell, just with the naked eye or with the simple uh, desk lamp with an LED lamp and a magnifying glass, which you can get in an office supply store for about 60 bucks. So these are the tools I used. And then I'll slice off the outer part of the bud, uh, exposing the inner cluster or the inner leaf bud. <clears throat> and then I'll take the tip of the bud and peel away the other side of the bud scales and that exposes the flower cluster, which tends to stick together as you peel away the outer bud. <coughs> and then these flower clusters have this characteristic swelling along the side and coming to a point and you can start, sort of see the individual flowers at this time of the year with the king blooming here and the side cluster, 
five flowers here. This is a picture of a leaf bud, which is basically hollow on the inside. So if you do this enough, you get really good at this. Here's more pictures. Sometimes you see in between ones where the flower clusters undeveloped and these are not likely to set fruit, but they might contribute to biennial bearing and leaf buds. Pictures of the spurs that I thought were definitely fruit buds. That's what these look like right here, here, here. The in-between types where the buds are smaller and then the ones that I thought were not flower fruit buds. These are leaf buds. So after dissecting, what I found was that in the, the spurs that I thought were definitely fruit buds, um, there were 20 of them and every one of them had a flower cluster. <clears throat> then the ones that I didn't know for certain only one of the, these was a leaf bud. And then out of the ones that I thought were not flower buds, um, six of them ended up having flowers. So um, my first guess was 29 fruit buds. After dissection, I found 34 fruit buds. So I somewhat underestimated in this case. When I did this in February, I was overestimating the number of flower buds. But um, so uh, what does this mean for pruning? If, uh, if you only want 10 fruit on this limb and you have 34 fruit buds uh, and you want to keep two for uh, those 10, two flower clusters per one fruit at final harvest, you, I guess you would prune off about 14 flower buds off this one limb. So um, there are some more precise methods for determining how many flower buds to keep on a tree, but I tend to do this more intuitively because I don't like counting and it's tedious and time consuming. So when I'm pruning, I tend to just look at each individual tree and prune them the way I think they should be needed. So where I see an overabundance of flower clusters <clears throat> or they're spaced too close together, I'll snip some off. But other people have a more precise method where uh, you keep 15 to 20 flower buds for every 10 fruit you want at harvest. And uh, you decide how many bushels of apples you want in your orchard and then divide that number by the number of trees and then turn that into a number of fruit per tree and then count the flower buds on that tree and then prune off the excess uh, spurs. So in this example, if you wanted 700 bushels in your acre, 700 bushels per acre and you have 900 trees per acre, that amounts to uh, eight tenths of a bushel per tree, the uh, decided crop load that you want to have at harvest. And um, if it's honey crisp, the apples are kind of large. I would expect there to be about 90 fruit per bushel. Multiply that by uh, the ideal um, yield per tree and you come up with about 70 to fruit per tree is what you would want on those trees at harvest. <clears throat> and if you want to keep two spurs for each of those fruit, you would keep 144 bud per tree. A lot of numbers, a lot of counting. So uh, I hate counting, so I do this intuitively and I'll look at each tree individually and I'll look at the limbs individually and if I see too many uh, spurs on it, I'll prune I'll start by pruning off the ones on the undersides of the branch. And then I'll, if I see clumps of cluster spurs together, uh, I'll prune them down so that there's one bud per spur. And then from there, I'll start reducing additional uh, fruit buds. So I have more questions in this. As Terry mentioned, research never ends because we always come up with more questions. And we want to fine tune our techniques. So uh, one of the complaints I've heard is that this spur pruning takes too much time. So I have another study where I'm just simply removing limbs from the tree to see if uh, this also helps to moderate the crop. And I'm comparing this to spur pruning. And then, um, so what are the long-term effects of these two techniques, limb renewal and spur pruning? And um, the, um, I'm going to continue these projects 
through um, a couple more years. And then most of this research has been done with tall spindle trees. So this year I started um, doing spur pruning and limb renewal on bigger, older trees. And I won't know how well this works until uh, next year. So um, that's all I have for, um, for spur pruning. Do we have any questions or do we want to wait until the end? And we do have one now. When you are removing limbs, are you leaving uh, zero inches, one inches, two inches? How long are your stubs? Uh, yeah, that's a good question because Honeycrisp doesn't like to regrow from a stub. So I prune back to a side spur or a side branch to ensure that there's something that's going to regrow in that spot. So it's not based on inches. It's based on whether or not there's a leaf bud or a flower bud that's willing to regrow that um, that limb that I take off just to, to prevent um, over pruning and reducing the yield too much. All right, thanks Renee, that's all I see for now. Okay, turning it over to you. All right, thanks Renee. Um, so we've talked a bit about how uh, the new varieties or, or, or the, the high value that's required, I think, to um, uh, grow cider apples uh, as an intentional uh, production system, as opposed to selling, uh, you know, the coals from your dessert apple orchard, often means growing varieties that are different from what we're used to, uh, or at least from what our industry kind of evolved around in, in New England. And uh, that might mean changing a few things. And that already came up uh, in the discussion, I think, with Renee um, there, that a lot of the work that that's being done uh, is done on tall spindle orchards, where uh, orchards are being planted you know, at fairly high cost with a known um, potential return based upon the um, uh, production numbers, you know, do we know we can hit 800 or 1000 or more bushels per acre with annual varieties and we know what the, the value of those might be. And so there's there's a more known quantity. Um, sometimes that's not, not necessarily how uh, orchards might be replanted. So um, wanted to look at another one of the issues here um, as folks, this is that same table we looked at before, um, and this is a segue just to give you a heads up for a second um, to you, Liz, um, to one of the other major issues. I mean, why aren't people planting uh, uh, European type or other even North American type cider apples? We already learned that biennialism is a real concern amongst folks. And the other one that I think is just as important, particularly when we're talking about the European type or the European origin uh, cider varieties is uh, fire blight, uh, is, is a real problem, a real issue amongst some of these varieties uh, to the point where I've, I've planted in the course, not quite of this, this project, I, I planted a few years before this project started, but I have about a five-year-old uh, orchard that was planted and ripped out within five years because the fire blight was just getting so bad and spreading elsewhere. Um, we decided to clean the slate and start again. And I, I don't think that that's actually a, uh, a, 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 a unique to our situation. Um, so it's something that's that's a real concern when growing these varieties. And with that quick segue, I'm going to hand this over to um, Liz to talk about some of the work um, happening at UMA UMass. Great, thanks, Terry. So there's a handful of us folks down here at UMass that are working on uh, this project uh, to include myself, uh, Jaime Pinero, John Clements, and Dan Cooley. Um, with cider apples, there had at some point been this conversation around our ability to produce these apples with reduced input uh, in terms of pest management. While there still seems to be some places that we can play with that, one of the places that we cannot play with that is when it comes to weed management. For all of the same reasons that you need to take care of your weeds in your primary apple blocks, you need to take care of them in your cider blocks. Uh, rosy apple aphid really likes to hang out on narrow leaf and broad leaf plantain. If you have that happening in your orchard, they will multiply there and you'll have a larger population going into the coming season than you had in this prior season. Dogwood borer, of course, is an issue, especially with these newer trees going in. Um, 
they like to infest those burn knots that tend to happen on rootstocks and the lower trunks of the trees, especially when weeds grow up and create that humid environment around the trunk. And of course, voles are the bane of our existence. Keeping your weed management well under hand, in hand is a good way to manage those voles as well. Uh, I'm not gonna go too in depth into weed management. Next week, we actually have uh, Dr. Thierry Bessensong coming from Rutgers to talk about integrated weed management. Uh, and so he will cover that at great length. Um, just a, a point to make that you really do have to manage your weeds in your cider apples. There's no, op, no uh, getting around that one. Terry mentioned fire blight. So again, this common knowledge with it when it comes to cider apples is cider apples are really susceptible to fire blight. There's varying degrees of susceptibility with that though. Uh, and in 2020, we actually had the opportunity to make a little bit of a comparison between a handful of some of these European cider varieties, Medal Dior, uh, Kingston Black, and Ellis Bitter. Um, Kingston Black, of course, is known as the perfect cider apple. It's got just the right blend of everything. That's one of the reasons why people really want to grow it, um, but are afraid to because of this, this fire blight issue. And of course, because Kingston Black is very biennial. Ellis Bitter is a really nice early season apple. It's ripening sometime in September, and that's a good apple to have in to blend in for early ciders. Uh, Medal Dior is actually highly valued for its tannic content. Uh, when we talk about cider apples as spitters, this one is the epitome of that. You really want to get that thing out of your mouth as fast as you can. It does not taste nice. But in moderation, in a blend of cider, it adds an excellent complexity to the cider. One of the issues, of course, with this fire blight concern is that these varieties wake up a little bit later than our traditional, or rather our primary or dessert varieties. So we had in 2020, April 29th, Kingston Black and Ellis Bitter were, were at about quarter inch green. Medal Dior was just hitting green tip. Um, May 8th, we had Kingston Black and Ellis Bitter around tight cluster and Medal Dior was just about half inch green. We started to get into bloom around May 17th and that was Kingston Black hitting that king bloom. But Ellis Bitter and Medal Dior were still sort of straggling back um, at pink. Zestar, for a framework of uh, frame of comparison here, had bloom on May 4th. So we had our first bloom in our cider variety about two weeks later. Now over here you see this uh, output from NUA, this, um, this, the fire blight model here. And so what I did with this model is I adjusted the biofix in it. So rather than using that first bloom in the whole orchard, what I did is I put in the first bloom in my cider block, which was with this Kingston Black for this particular comparison here, was that May 17th. Now, had we been using our other variety or other varieties as a biofix, obviously we would have run out of fire blight potential because bloom would have ended for those dessert varieties, but we're not dealing with those dessert varieties right now. So we have a significantly extended window of opportunity for fire blight to cause blossom infection because we've got open blossoms. Uh, so you'll see over here in this table, 17th, there was no potential for fire blight because the blossoms had just started to open. Uh, but when you start to come down here until May 23rd, whoops, you see that we do have this infection potential based on our EIP value. So by the 23rd, we've got open flowers on Ellis Bitter, Medal Dior, Kingston Black is probably just about done at that point. So what we saw was that Kingston Black actually didn't have any fire blight that year. We did have fruit that year, uh, but Ellis Bitter and Medal Dior had 12 or 15 strikes respectively. I also looked at the length of the strikes. And so what we had was four different measurements, less than two inches, two inches, two to five inches and more than five inches. Um, again, no strikes in the Kingston Black, but we had more um, overall length of shoot showing infection on the Ellis Bitter than we did on the Medal Dior. However, the interesting thing about that is that with the Medal Dior, the shoots weren't as long. And so what happened is the fire blight was actually 
slamming straight through those shoots and down into the trunk to the point where it even got into the inter interstem. So this uh, particular block was top worked in 2017. Um, so even though it looks as though Ellis Bitter in numbers was more susceptible, the Medal Dior actually was had greater damage to the tree itself from fire blight. So if we have our trees coming out of dormancy later, if we have later bloom, it's entirely possible that the copper application that we put on the rest of our orchard for our dormant copper application is too early for these cider varieties. So if we have Kingston Black, Ellis Better, um, Medal Dior still dormant, even though the rest of our orchard has come out of dormancy, it's important to think about whether or not you might want to put a copper application on those cider varieties in order to knock that population back again. Because it's going to continue to grow as the temperatures warm, even though the tree itself still remains dormant. Um, of course, maintaining your weather stations is important across the board. Uh, garbage in, garbage out is, is this adage that we hear a lot when we talk about pest forecast models, because if you're your weather station isn't accurately reporting information, that bad information is going to be fed into the model. And so the output that you get from the model isn't going to be as accurate as you need it to be. So just make sure that like right now is a great time to do this before things get totally hairy. Uh, make sure that there's no bird's nests in your rain gauge. Make sure that your um, leaf wetness sensor is wiped off, all of those kinds of things. Just make sure that it's working in the right way. And then again, as I said before, adjust the biofix in your models so that it reflects the cultivar that you're dealing with. A um, couple of weeks ago, we had Carrot Cox uh, here on our noontime sessions, and he did an excellent job talking about streptomycin, biologicals, and other uh, ways to manage fire blight. I will, once I'm done giving my portion of this talk, I'll pop the link to that video into the chat so that you can access that to uh, get some more information on that piece. So we had our 2021 pre-harvest pest observations. Um, in this particular case, we had 20 trees of each variety assessed. These were non-destructive assessments and uh, 200 fruit per variety. One of the things that we noticed was that here we see Wixen, pretty attractive to Plum Curculio and Stink Bug in this one orchard here on the left. Um, and then over here on the right, we noticed that again, Wixen was very attractive to Plum Curculio. That kind of carries through in some of the other work that we've got going on, as I'm sure many of you know, Jaime has, Jaime Pinero has a uh, grafting project going that he's using to assess Plum Curculio attract and kill strategies. And so Wixen crab is one of the varieties that he's using in that trial. And across the board in the orchards that he's seeing, or that he's using, he's actually seeing Wixen is indeed more attractive to Plum Curculio, which is great for the attract and kill. Maybe not so great uh, if you're trying to grow Wixen for your primary crop. The thing to notice about this though, is that this is superficial damage. So we're talking about a pre-harvest survey, right? So that drop that's gonna occur from infestation has already happened. We're still getting fruit. They're just a little banged up. So when it comes to cider, obviously we don't mind some scars. So there's still some work that needs to be done here that would help us tease out whether or not we're actually losing fruit in of Wixen to Plum Curculio if we're just seeing more damage. Uh, and Dabinet comparatively is less attractive, which again, if you're growing Dabinet for your cider is really good news. Um, one of the other things that we have been looking at is maturity assessment and harvest dates. I'd like to thank uh, Carlson Orchards for taking really good, consistent harvest data and sharing that with us. Uh, so we've got two different years here. We're going to look at Wixen and we're going to look at Dabinet for this. I'm not going to go into the other varieties. That information will be available for you. Uh, we just don't, we're not going to go del delve into that too deeply today. Uh, so in 2020, harvest date for Wixen was October 21st, 2021, October 25th. Uh, the 
overall harvest on Wixen actually increased over those two years, uh, which is not a surprise given that this is a relatively new planting. So I believe, if I remember collect correctly, this block was put in in 2017. I did a maturity assessments in uh, September 8th in 2020, September 23 in 2021. Uh, obviously at this point in the September, Wixen was not ready. Our target bricks is somewhere around 21 to 23. And when I did these assessments, we were looking at 13 to 12. I think here we have some room again to do some more research because as you can see, the starch index, or as you know, the starch index ratings are based on um, Gala Honeycrisp Macintosh. We haven't done um, a detailed study of any of these particular varieties. As Terry mentioned before, there's just so many of them, uh, it's gonna take a long time to get all of that done. But we do have a good start going here with this particular orchard and these particular varieties that we're looking at. Again, Deb and Nett, um, same general harvest time, but you see a decrease in the, the yield um, over the two year period here. And this sort of indicates to us that we are dealing with a slightly biennial tree there tree in this orchard. Um, but again, you know, we've got our target bricks we hit in late September in 2021. We weren't quite there yet in uh, earlier September in 2020. Uh, and you see here that these, this, the starch index rating is kind of variable. So the crop isn't necessarily ripening all at the same time or really even in a close tidy window. All right, so uh, thank you again to Carlson Orchard and to Cider Hill Orchard for allowing me to come in and sample your fruit and check for pest stuff. And also uh, thank you to Jaime's lab. Jalen Kasoy, especially in Beto, have done a really, have been really helpful in collecting the data, especially from these grafted blocks that Jaime has been working on. So with that, Terry, hand back over to you. So one of the items that I wanted to highlight um, with the interest in uh, uh, switching cultivars over fairly quickly, there's a, there's a lot of interest potentially in top grafting orchards over. Um, here you can see a project that, that we did. This is not cider apples, um, but very similar where you have trees that were uh, planted on one day, not quite, not quite the same day, but um, they're adjacent. And, uh, and top grafted essentially at the same time. And uh, six years later, uh, actually this is no, uh, three years later, sorry. Uh, we have uh, our original uh, orchard, which is kind of underperforming for a few other few reasons. This, this orchard on the right uh, and top grafted trees that took off uh, and established themselves pretty substantially in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty, um, um, you know, rapid uh, time period in terms of, of comparison. And fairly simple process to do. Um, Want to give word to the to the late uh, Russ Allen who helped us graft at this point. Um, uh, fairly simple work. This right now is a perfect time uh, to be getting out there and doing this. And this is a way that you can really quickly flip over uh, varieties uh, and and try something new uh, without the expense of pulling out trees and you know renovating your orchard and spending the extra time of with replant issues and whatnot. Um, but I wanted to highlight a few things about this. Um, one of the things I like to point out is that an orchard that you're going to top craft, um, you should not be an orchard you need to top craft. It needs to be essentially in perfect health um, with plenty of life going uh, in those trees, kind of moving forward. Um, you don't want to have a compromised block in a wet spot or frosty spot or whatever. Um, because you're basically, you know, you're, you're doing a major surgery and, and renovating um, these trees. You might get substantial growth pretty quickly. You know, in this case, we had 18 year old root systems feeding into some pretty small, uh, you know, handful of buds. And so we got tremendous growth. Um, but the, the livelihood or, or the length of time these trees might, might perform uh, reduces a bit. Potentially. So again, looking at my net present value chart, um, this is based upon that same one that we looked at before. The vertical ax costs us $12,000 to, to plant this uh, orchard. And you know, we can see based on annual production, $20 a bushel, 
pretty good substantial uh, return uh, going out for 20 years. If we were to top graph that, so we've got a substantially lower price. Now, this is it makes there's a whole lot of assumptions that are kind of balled into this. Um, one is is what would you have been making off the off of this orchard that was already bearing with Macintosh or or Gala or whatever you're top grafting to during this part of the curve? Um, but let's just say on uh, on the assumption that that you've got a choice to make: either grow that crop this year or top graft it. Um, based on our numbers, we found that actually within about three to four four years or so, um, on a vertical axe type uh, production system, so trees that are you know five to eight feet apart, maybe uh, 14 to 16 feet between rows, um, you know, 400, 600 trees per acre. Um, so you don't have to have a huge canopy to refill. Uh, you can be back to full production in about three, four, four years or so uh, and start to make money pretty fast. So this starts to look like an ideal situation maybe, um, but there's a whole lot of assumptions in there, including that you even have uh, an orchard like that to work with. If you put in a factor in here um, that the trees will start to decline, uh, and I was a little bit harsh on this, I think, but I, I started to have at year 10, I started taking 5% of the trees would start dying um, until I got down to about 50% of the trees um, living. I think it was year five, I started killing the trees. Um, it doesn't take long to realize that, that a top grafting scenario um, can be pretty risky. There can be a lot of, of issues potentially with um, uh, switching this over uh, and assuming that you're going to have as long of a lifespan of the orchard as you would have if you, if you replanted them from the beginning. I'm going to skip past that. Another couple of things we looked at uh, that we've been looking at over time here is um, some other varieties um, aside from just the um, uh, uh, European type um, that might make sense in terms of use in cider production. So looking at some of these, you know, some of the notion that um, uh, European varieties are specifically what uh, uh, cideries are looking for you know, I, I would push back on that a little bit because um, folks are mostly looking for flavors and aromas uh, and not necessarily varieties. I mean, there are some like Kingston Black that do carry uh, a certain name recognition, um, but there are certain varieties that might have, um, you know, other characteristics and be substantially easier to grow. Um, there is some uh, thought that, uh, or not thought, some science behind um, the uh, uh, notion that uh, the synthesis of phenolic compounds in the leaves and tissues of the plant um, is, a, is an important part of the role of scab resistance, especially in, in VF gene varieties. And um, some of these varieties can have pretty high phenolic compounds. And when I say phenolic compounds, those are uh, a very broad class, what we call tannins, but also other um, compounds that contribute to the complexity of cider. So if we look at these varieties, so this is a, 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 a selection from a, 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 I should say planted in 2015, from an orchard we had planted a number of years ago. Um, the, the phenolic compounds, as we look in here, um, when you look at dessert varieties, typically 300 to 400 milligrams per liter would be kind of the tops of your of your tannins. And this is where if you ferment those out, um, leads to a, I would say, arguably less complex cider. Whereas the uh, European varieties might be in the 2000 to 3000 milligrams per liter. And many of these varieties fall kind of right in the middle of that. And the other thing about these varieties, when we look at something like Liberty, uh, a few of us uh, in New England worked on this a number of years ago, like 20, five years ago, there was an effort to try to, 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 to push Liberty to, to be a commercial variety uh, in, the, in the region and uh, never really took off, but there's still quite a few Liberty trees out there. And I say we were just 25 years behind our plans because we're finding Liberty actually has quite high phenolics, a um, little bit high acidity, but it's really, really easy to grow. I mean, none of this discussion about biennialism would ever come up in the, in the uh, case of Liberty. So this is an area that I think it makes sense for growers to uh, consider if you already have some. These are also dual purpose varieties. So they're, uh, you know, Crimson Crisp is one of the best flavored apples I've ever tried. Uh, and it can make a lot of sense to uh, 
uh, uh, grow these varieties for your high value markets, you pick your own and then use the seconds um, for a high value cider. Um, so let's not ignore um, these varieties and actually consider that these might be an important part of, uh, of, of fruit production. Another piece I wanted to highlight, and I, I mentioned this, this wasn't really part of, of NECAP, but it sort of is a, is a side piece. Um, I have a, a student uh, who's doing some work. He's actually uh, uh, planting an orchard up on the Canadian border, not far from, from this tree or a few miles from this tree, which is the original Franklin cider apple. Um, I don't know that this is an avenue that, this is where, again, the, um, the differences in scale really kind of uh, uh, will play out here. You know, I think very few decent sized production orchards are going to be scrounging around in the hedgerows looking for the ideal fruits um, that they could propagate in their orchards. But there, is, there are a handful of growers and even in fact a handful of, of decent sized growers um, who have grafted trees from others who have evaluated these fruit and uh, trying them out in an orchard situation to see if they can improve production. So looked at some, some feral fruit a few years ago, um, number of tagged ones. The, the, the key thing I wanna show here, um, this one, which is the, the, the only one to my knowledge that in recent years has actually been released as a variety, this Franklin cider apple, has got some of the highest tannins we've ever measured uh, in my lab anyway. Um, as well as some of the some pretty awful high acids and, and some pretty uh, high sugars. So this is something that that's out on the market. Um, it's a pretty rough, I'd say, in terms of um, uh, making a straight cider. It's just so tannic and so acidic. However, um, we've had uh, somewhere on the level of 50, 60,000 trees go in uh, in at, that I know of in northern New England in the last few years. And I think we'll see more of this on the market. So not far from there, the, the student that I have uh, working with me uh, spent some time in Northern New England uh, working on um, both uh, um, evaluating fruit on his farm, which had an older orchard, um, as well as um, from a nursery in, in, in Northern Vermont that was evaluating several hundred varieties. When we look at high, high tannin versus, versus uh, um, acidity, there's certain lines that divide out um, bitter sharp, bitter sweet. So, so um, whether or not you have high tannins or high acidity or low acidity. And so he tagged things by taste. And then we plotted that, uh, tested them in the lab and then plotted it out based upon um, the actual juice data analysis. And we actually found that um, it's actually not that hard for people to sort out those varieties, those characteristics by taste and do things fairly quickly that way in terms of screening cultivars. Um, so stay tuned, that data still needs to be, I think, better analyzed. Um, but that's something that, that is, is making a number of, of producers, especially on the smaller scale side, are, um, are heading into that area. And I think it's an area where folks can do some on-farm research or potentially um, propagate the varieties from some of these smaller producers and grow them out on a larger scale. Let me see here. I want to highlight some of the continued work that we're doing uh, with this particular project anyway. Uh, this project itself is wrapping up, but that doesn't mean that cider apple production isn't ending in the region. I know UMass is planting a new cider orchard. There's substantial work being done uh, just across the lake from us over in, in New York. Uh, we will be putting out a New England cider apple production guide we're working on now. Um, this spring, there is a chapter in the, in the tree fruit management guide on ciders, which will be fleshing that out. And uh, I have uh, a group of students who are working now on uh, interviewing some growers to get some case studies um, that we'll be including in that particular uh, production guide to kind of glean some of the information from uh, growers who have tried this and, and have some information to share. And then uh, starting next year, there will be a, a rootstock trial going in in New England, as well as just coordinated by Greg Peck at, at Cornell um, across the region to start to look at some of the newer uh, rootstocks to see which ones might perform best uh, and potentially have effects on cider quality. So with that, I'm gonna wrap this up and maybe start digging into some questions. Uh, we do have a question. Oh, uh, any work on sweet and hard ciders? You know, 
I, I wish. Uh, I haven't done any work on sweet ciders. I think that I, I yeah, I've done no work on that. Um, the cider side, we don't have any anyone in, in New England that has a, uh, a a proper lab to do that work. So most of the folks who are doing work on on cider on the on the fermented product um, comes out of either Cornell or Virginia Tech who have that that work. More, I'd say, just as importantly, not more importantly, but just as importantly, um, there's a tremendous amount of of innovation happening in the um, you know amongst the cider making uh, community. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of changes in there, but no, not on our side. Any work being done on storability treatments, MCP, CA? Renee, do you know on that? Not specifically on um, apples that would be for hard cider. We're all, all, we've got our hands full dealing with the Honeycrisp issue in the post-harvest world. Yeah, I think most of the, the economics of, of cider varieties um, mostly suggest that you want to get these things pressed and into the marketplace. Um, there's a there's a there's a dearth of fruit being produced. So it's not like the, the sort of thing you're going to need to store and spend the money to store um, to get it onto the market later. Okay, thanks. Any work on red flesh varieties? I know Redfield's been pretty popular in New England and certainly the Geneva crab mm -hmm. um, could certainly be used for a, a red flesh. Any any of you looking at that more closely? Listen. Yeah, so we have been working with uh, Redfield, and it's a really nice apple to grow. <laughs> it doesn't go biennial. It seems to be pretty resistant to just about everything. I don't notice much by way of plum capulio damage. I don't see much internal damage, and I don't see scab or fire blight or any of those things that we typically worry about. Um, we haven't done anything uh, very focused as it relates to Redfield, but it, these are just our general observations that we're seeing. Um, I know there are some other red flesh, but we don't really have any right now that are um, online such that we can assess them. All right, thanks, Liz. I do see a, across the border in, in Quebec for me that they're using a bit of Geneva as a something to get a, a rosé style, but I, I don't have too much... Uh, more than just I, I visited the tasting rooms a couple of times at this point. Yeah, I'm seeing that actually. Uh, uh, there, it doesn't take, especially something like um, Redfield. The the red is really stable, unlike uh, you know some there are in Redfield. I know some of the crab apples that might not be as stable and it might fade uh, through fermentation. But I know a number of cideries that add just a touch. You don't have to add a lot. Uh, to to make that rosé, and I, it might be marketing as much as anything. Redfield also has a very distinctive aroma that I don't find very pleasant, but that's that's me. Which rootstock is generally used in newly planted orchards? Yeah, good question. Um, big trees or little trees? Uh, so I think a lot of the orchards that are being planted, um, unfortunately, cider apples are such a small part of of the of the industry. Uh, that unless you have specifically ordered your trees and 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 custom budded them, you get what you get. And and sometimes I've seen some problems with quality of of trees if you're just buying the trees that are on the market um, because they really are kind of the also rands. Um, uh, however, I think growers I know the growers who are producing um, intentionally planting and really planning ahead like you should with any uh, orchard are using some of the, the, the newer varieties. I know Geneva 41 is, is the main rootstock on uh, one of our more popular orchards. Grown tall spindle with you know wires and, and poles and whatnot. Um, on the flip side, a number of growers are also interested in uh, real trees, especially trees uh, if they may be shaken either by hand or mechanically. Uh, something with a stronger rootstock. So we've seen where some growers are using maybe bud 118, which is kind of on the substantially larger sides. Um, I would be careful with anything that has a uh, weak graft union, like a G30 or something like that, which is kind of falling out of favor. But like I say, most of your of your trees, if you're buying them, unless you've specifically selected a rootstock, um, you're kind of getting what's what's being used. Uh, could you please provide additional detail on what phenolic content is? and how scab can affect its level in apples? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, phenolic content, ph ph phenolics, total phenolics is a big bucket. Um, we call them tannins, but there's uh, you know hundreds of compounds that fall within that. And when you think about that within plants and juices in general, um, 
they fall into the categories that provide flavors, aromas, bittering in terms of, of um, cider apples to some degree, not always. Um, so it's a, the, the method that we use in, in our lab is, is, is a pretty broad brush, but generally speaking, the more phenols you have, it's more um, um, you know, six carbon molecules and kind of complex molecules that um, provide complexity and flavor to your cider. As far as how scab affects it, um, there was some work done back in the 70s by Andrew Lee at, at the um, Long Atchin Research Station in, in, um, in the UK um, and found that stressed trees um, contribute more phenolics, more tannin to the, to the juice. Um, and that's not surprising. I actually just barely submitted a paper on a different project looking at tomato production. Um, we found that the most stressed tomatoes had the highest phenolics and, and it makes sense. So these are compounds that the plant often produces as defensive mechanism. Um, the thing about it is this notion that we need to stress our plants, whether they're grapevines or apple trees or whatever, um, to increase the phenolics you know, the range of increase is substantially less than the range you would, than the, than the difference you would get based upon growing a different variety. And oftentimes those stressed plants underperform in other ways. They grow, they, you know, they grow less, they yield less, um, you know, the disease often leads to fruit, you know, rotten fruit or cracked fruit. So I wouldn't say don't spray for scab because you'll get more phenols in your juice. Um, that would be a, a foolish thing to do, I would say. And to follow up with that, Terry, any mm. stress that you subject your trees to, you're, you're going to increase your uh, potential for other issues such as black stem borer um, and overall decline, which we're seeing more and more as we're seeing variability in our rainfall throughout the season. So generally speaking, if you want your trees to stay healthy, to produce healthy apples, uh, over a significant period of time, stressing them isn't really going to give you enough of an increase in your juice quality to counteract the decrease in the overall health of the tree. All right. Thank you both. Uh, what is your ratio of pears to apples per bushel in sweet cider? Any, uh, any secret recipes? I've got no recipe there. I, I, I got done making sweet cider years ago. <laughs> I, I wish I had something. Uh, what resources are available for analyzing feral varieties for potential propagation? Or yeah, so that's, any? yeah, uh, well, not yet, but it's, it's literally being, being banged out right now. So that, that's where um, this student who's doing a, a side project, um, this is his output, will be a, um, a guide to some of the things to look for, um, how to field test for, um, you know, for these various characteristics, um, a little, little thing on grafting 101. Um, the main thing that I would say as far as analyzing feral varieties, number one, um, you're not going to change the industry based on this. I mean, this is pretty niche stuff. But um, one of the things that I really, really uh, push for, if you go looking um, out in the hedgerows uh, or on the sides of the road with, with feral apples, you'll find bitter, either bittersweet or bitter sharp varieties everywhere. I mean, that's just when, when an apple tree reverts back to uh, you know, it's older uh, um, uh, breeding, you know, when it, when it goes to seed and, and you plant that seed or it's, or it's, or it's just grown fairly, um, it steps back and kind of moves to a set of genetics that lends itself to bitter, you know, tarts. We know how roadside apples are. So th there are a dime a dozen. The key to making that a business is being able to reliably produce them and efficiently produce them. And so what I counsel folks, and I've done this for a number of folks, including um, some fairly decent sized cideries, uh, I think of Shaxbury in Vermont, who's uh, made a, uh, a, a, a whole line of ciders based upon some of these feral apples that they have sort of domesticated. Number one uh, uh, characteristic that I tell them to look for is look for apples that are annual. If, if biennialism is such an issue, uh, if you visit trees on a regular basis and they have a crop every year, have some kind of a crop, those are the ones to look for. The, the bitter part is not hard to find in, in a, a you know, wild type apple, but annual is number one. And then once you've, once you've done that, graft it, try some, some uh, grafts onto a tree, that, you know, preferably onto a larger tree, top graft a few so you can grow them fairly fast. See how they look in, an orchard once you plant them out and grow them because they often look very different from that 
old tree that's grown on the roadside next to a brook somewhere and is stressed. I mean, some of those phenolics might come from this, you know, uh, wild half dead tree. Um, so it oftentimes they'll they'll look and perform very differently. But annual is is number one. And then stay tuned. We'll send something out to this list when when that guide's ready, which I expect uh, should be probably by the time the growing season's up and running. All right, thanks, Terry. Do you feel that copper induced russeting affects cider production or is the disease reduction worth it? Well, I think that's one of the benefits that we have to, um, uh, to growing apples intended for cider is that we don't care what they look like. And saying we don't care what they look like doesn't mean we can let the scab go rampant or we can let the curculio go rampant. I mean, those can really cut into actual production. Um, Copper induced russeting, I don't worry about. And in fact, I think it's a tool that is useful um, in cider apple production. The other thing is with the extreme fire blight susceptibility of some of these varieties, I don't think you're gonna copper your way out of it. You're not gonna think you're gonna be applying copper all season. Um, you've gotta really be applying a broader um, um, you know, management program, you know, low fertility as much as possible, don't, don't have those succulent shoots, cut everything out as you see it, copper at the beginning of the season, as soon as you see it, uh, copper, you know, you know, cut it out and more copper, um, appropriately more copper, I should say, um, you know, these low, low rate coppers, uh, Cueva and Badge and things like that, um, are useful and, and, and can uh, provide a certain amount of management, um, but it's not the only tool that's that's there but yeah i think the fact that you don't have to worry about what these fruit look like you can you can tolerate some russeting and and as far as i've seen um and i'm a, a you know i ferment a lot but it's all you know large amateur scale i would say um and i have fermented um certainly varieties that we've done summer copper on and i haven't seen that it affects things all right thanks terry um any concern with spur removal and copper treatments as far as um timing as an example. Renee, maybe I'll let you weigh on. I'll talk about copper, I think. I mean, I just think in, in New England orchards, copper is just a, it's, it, it's the first spray you put on, period, um, nowadays. I mean, whether it's a, a highly susceptible, fire blight susceptible cider variety or Macintosh, um, that's just what we've moved toward because fire blights become so prevalent. Um, I don't know about your timing, what, what you're thinking with in terms of, um, spur removal. I haven't gotten into that myself. I, I know here on my side of the lake, you know, we're putting copper on and then doing spur, you know, pruning after the fact. So um, I, I can't imagine it would be particularly harmful. I don't know if there's a, a certain time frame you want to keep those apart, but um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Renee, do you have any thoughts on that? I usually try to do my spur pruning before the copper goes on, but no, I don't always get that done. And uh, when I'm out there, pruning and the trees have been sprayed, I always make sure I wash my hands as soon as I go back inside. Well, I think okay. the reality of pruning is that we all hope we get our pruning done before the copper goes on, but that doesn't always happen either. So. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So there, there are times when I have to do bloom count yeah. af before I do the spur pruning. And yes, I'm exposing myself to copper. And, and when I leave the orchard, I change clothes, take a shower at the end of the day. That's standard practice for people who, who are working in an orchard. We do have another question. Any different fertilizer approach versus dessert apples? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can speak to that only to say that there's, there's experts who have done, who've, who've dug into that work. We haven't really dug into it in, in the case of this project here. Um, a lot of that work has been looked at happening at Cornell. Um, and elsewhere, um, but primarily Cornell. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I'm enough of an expert to, to give recommendations on that. I know that um, the notion, the older notion, and this was a lot of this was propagated by some of that 1970s um, research that, that led a lot of folks to think that you want to um, under fertilize and under nitrogenize, uh, you know, under reduce the nitrogen fertilization uh, in order to improve uh, potentially the juice quality based upon the phenolic content and slow the fermentation is, is really not the way that that's kind of the, the, the modern thinking is going. We see, um, you do see the, the fertility treatments carry over into the juice in terms of free um, um, yeast available nitrogen. Um, 
we see in the US palette compared to the kind of old world sort of British cider palette where there was a lot of tolerance for stinky fermentations, uh, stuff that smell like a, a barn or you know, have a lot of sulfur compounds. Um, there's less tolerance for that in, in the North American market. And so I see that many commercial cider makers are either adding or generally are often adding some kind of yeast nutrient to reduce um, those smells and aromas. And there's a fair amount of work um, that's been coming out of, of Greg's lab um, that shows that 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 the, that can be carried through um, in the uh, in the orchard. I I do caution that. I mean, you know, I don't want to say don't walk out of here saying, well, Terry said fertilize the heck out of your trees um, for a number of reasons. But high nitrogen fertilization applications um, really do set the trees up to be more susceptible, particularly to fire blight. Um, so I would be what I typically do when 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 I um, both fertilize our trees, but also give recommendations to growers. Um, you can fall on a range that you that you select based upon your soil type, your soil analysis, and then more importantly, your your foliar analysis. And um, I always say fertilize on the lower side of that range. Um, don't ignore it. Um, you know, most of our growers in Vermont, depending upon the soil type, I I don't even want to put a number out there because someone will walk out and, and apply that to their to their orchard. But um, yeah, do the do the minimum nitrogen you need to, but put the nitrogen on that you need to, but I, I am, I, I, I am not a proponent of the cider trees don't need nitrogen argument. Well, thank you. I see we've hit 129. Um, I will make sure that the folks on this list um, get the outputs that are gonna be coming out in the next couple months uh, from this, this project, uh, get a link to Cider Guides. Um, I know that uh, 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 Nathaniel, my, my student is very excited to, Kind of present uh, his, uh, you know, how to how to find feral apples 101 uh, guide, and and we'll take it from there. All right. With that said, I think we're ready to close out. Um, Want to thank all the collaborators. Thank Mike for helping us out from across the lake, uh, and uh, we will see everyone next week uh, to learn a bit about uh, herbicide and weed management, and um, get out there and prune. It's a beautiful day out there.